Thank you everybody for joining us today for Virtual Pathology Grand Rounds. We're happy to host Dr. John Gross. Uh, Dr. Gross is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, uh, where he is an attending pathologist on the bone and soft tissue service and also signs out surgical pathology. Um, Dr. Gross began his um, college education at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, where he received a BS in biology, followed by a master's in clinical anatomy, and then stayed on for his medical degree, um, where he matriculated in 2012. Following uh, medical school, he went on to do two years of a general surgery residency in um, Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and then uh, saw the error of his ways and moved on to an anatomic and clinical pathology residency uh, back to Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska, where he also served as the chief resident. Following, following his anatomic and, pa anatomic and clinical pathology residency, he then went on to do a fellowship in bone and soft tissue pathology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And following that, he also completed a general surgical pathology fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So uh, he has a specific interest in bone and soft tissue neoplasms, and we're fortunate to have him today discuss with us updates from the 2020 WHO fifth edition bone and soft tissue tumor classification, what the general surgical pathologist needs to know. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I'm John Gross. Uh, and thank you to the University of North Carolina for this opportunity and for that uh, very nice introduction, Dr. Wapker. Um, today, I'm here to talk about the updates in the 2020 WHO fifth edition bone and soft tissue tumor classification. Um, and I'm having it sort of geared towards the general surgical pathologist uh, and, you know, updates that are needed for the general surgical pathologist. Certainly the information here will be relevant to uh, trainees um, and perhaps some of the bone and soft tissue pathologists out there. Uh, but, uh, but with that in, in mind, let's get started. <clears throat> um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, and importantly, I want to uh, start off by thanking and acknowledging the mentors that I've had um, in my uh, young career. Um, starting with the, the University of Washington, where uh, I had did my bone and soft tissue fellowship, led uh, by Dr. Rashadi, my program director, um, and then at the Mayo Clinic with my program director, Dr. Fritchie, uh, and all the other attendings at the Mayo Clinic and at the University of Washington. I spent uh, quite a bit of time with Dr. Stephen Billings and John Wright at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'd like to acknowledge the efforts that they've given to me and over the years. Uh, and Creighton University with program director, uh, Dr. Dietz, uh, Poonam Sharma, Dr. Hunter, Kalanta, and Nipper. Uh, and then finally, my mentors at the University of Nebraska with Dr. Scott Lauer and Dr. Julia Bridge, all of whom uh, have really helped shape my uh, education and my training. And while there are many other uh, pathologists and other physicians and mentors that I have, these are some of the ones that are, that are most important to me. And uh, I think that's um, <clears throat> important to, to acknowledge those who have helped show me the way. Um, as an outline, um, I'm gonna be talking about updates in the soft tissue tumors, followed by updates in round cell sarcomas, which is a new section in the fifth edition, uh, followed by updates in bone tumors. And then briefly, I'm gonna talk about some select mesenchymal tumors they're not covered in the WHO fifth edition bone and soft tissue text, but I think are relevant for the general surgical pathologist. Okay, the first tumor we'll talk about is um, a typical spindle cell polymorphic lipomanous tumor. So this is a new entity in this edition. Um, admittedly, I don't have any pictures of this tumor. Um, I've never uh, definitively seen one. Um, perhaps I have, but, but not anything that I have a picture of. But I can, I can explain it that it's a uh, benign adipocytic tumor 
with uh, an ill-defined tumor margins, mild to moderately atypical spindle cells, adipocytes, some uh, lipoblasts, uh, and some pleomorphic cells, as well as uh, variable multinucleated giant cells. Uh, it has loss of RB1 correlating to the deletion of the RB1 gene, <clears throat> similar to uh, spindle cell pleomorphic lipoma. Uh, moreover, it has CD34 expression. Importantly, it does not have MDM2 amplification. Uh, this is benign. 10% of them will recur locally, does not have metastatic potential, and there's no risk of de-differentiation. Okay, uh, now on to tumors that I have seen. Uh, here is a neoplasm, you see a, a superficial neoplasm, nodular mass, uh, quite cellular at low power. And you see on the right, diffusely CD34 positive, and then at the bottom, it's got a little bit of keratin expression. Higher power, uh, we have a uh, bizarre pleomorphism, uh, some of which have uh, nuclear inclusions. And the cytoplasm is kind of glassy, eosinophilic, uh, and some scattering uh, lymphocytes. <clears throat> so as many of you um, are aware, uh, this is a superficial CD34 positive fibroblastic tumor. And uh, this is a low-grade mesenchymal tumor of intermediate malignancy. It's superficial. It's got bizarre pleomorphism, um, but it has extremely rare mitotic activity. And that's really kind of like the key here because it's important not to call this some sort of undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or something. Uh, and those patients perhaps may be overtreated. Um, this is... <clears throat> not necessarily benign, so it's intermediate um, slash borderline malignancy, but it's, but it's important to recognize this entity. Uh, one, uh, in the, the original series of 18 cases, there was one reported lymph node mets, uh, no reported deaths. Okay, uh, the next tumor is uh, a new entity called EWSR1 SMAD3 positive fibroblastic tumor. Uh, and at low power, you see this little nodule in an acral location uh, that's got diffuse erg expression. Higher power, uh, very bland uh, spindle cells, diffusely and strongly positive for erg. Um, and again, a little higher power, you know, no mitotic activity, kind of bland fibroblastic spindle cells. Um, so it's benign, strong predilection for the hands and the feet. There's small, well demarcated neoplasms, nodular growth pattern, um, intersecting fascicles of these spindle cells. And really, the key here is this diffuse uh, ERG expression. Uh, and you'd think that it would be positive for SMA, but it's actually not um, smooth muscle actin positive, nor, is it, uh, nor does it express CD34. Um, and uh, as you can imagine with the name, it has an EWSR1 SMAD3 rearrangement. Uh, Okay, the next tumor we'll talk about, um, here's a lo low power view. You see this uh, variably hyalinized to myxoid background stroma with uh, a bunch of kind of delicate and somewhat ectatic uh, blood vessels, admixed uh, lymphocytes, um, kind of in a sheet-like pattern. Higher power view, you see some fairly bland spindle cells, real delicate uh, vessels, and this background myxoid stroma with some inflammatory cells. Um, and so, you know, kind of, it kind of uh, superficially resembles myxoid liposarcoma, but not really. It kind of superficially resembles solitary fibrous tumor, but not really. Uh, this is an angiofibroma of soft tissue. Uh, this is a, a new category in the uh, fifth edition. It's a benign fibroblastic neoplasm composed of uniform spindle cells, abundant fibromyxoid stroma, prominent network of innumerable branching thin walled blood vessels. There are rare local recurrences, no known metastatic potential. Um, it has a variable expression of EMA and CD34, and uh, it has a fusion, a translocation uh, 5 8 involving the A, H, R, R, and CoA2 genes. Uh, the USP6 rearranged family of mesenchymal tumors. I think this is an, an important. Um, update to the fifth edition. 
So we now know that um, USP6 rearranged tumors include nodular fasciitis, aneurysmal bone cyst, uh, which we knew that in the fourth edition. Uh, but now we know that fibro osseous pseudotumor of digits, myositis ossificans, a so-called cellular fibroma of tendon sheath, and as well as cranial fasciitis. So cranial fasciitis uh, generally occurring in uh, the skull, but having a morphology very similar to nodular fasciitis. In fact, many of these tumors have a very, very similar morphology, which uh, fits in many ways with their uh, similar genetics. Uh, and here is a Venn diagram that uh, we recently published uh, with my group from the University of Washington showing just the, the gene rearrangements, um, all having USP6 in common, but with various partners. CDH11 is uh, most commonly with aneurysmal bone cyst, fibrosis, pseudotumor, uh, call one, uh, myositis ossificans. Uh, our paper showing cellular fibroma tendon sheath, nodular fasciitis, cranial fasciitis, uh, all involve the call one a one MYH9 with nodular fasciitis is most commonly, but isn't seen in some of the others. Um, and uh, lastly, there are a couple reported examples, extremely rarely, of so-called malignant nodular fasciitis um, involving, so morphologically looking like nodular fasciitis, experts um, agreeing upon this, but um, it has a USP6, PPP6R3 gene rearrangement, but they're also an amplification. So there's an amplification event. Um, and actually, a, the first reported case was a few years ago by the Mayo Clinic, and then there's a second reported case now. Um, so I think that that is a, a real thing. Uh, but overwhelmingly, the, if you have a USP6 rearrangement, that's a benign feature. Uh, okay, here's another um, tumor, uh, very important tumor, I think. Um, it's this uh, spindle cell neoplasm. It has this kind of peculiar uh, perivascular collagen deposition um, and that these uh, and otherwise hard to really uh, describe other than just fairly bland and um, nondescript, I guess, uh, morphology. Uh, here's another um, case showing low power. And it's got a really interesting immunophenotype where it's diffusely positive for CD34, diffusely positive for S100, and completely lacking SOX10. So as many of you um, have guessed, this is a emergent and emerging entity known as the NTREC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm family. Um, so they have a wide uh, spectrum of morphologies and histologic grades. Uh, However, they're typically mon monomorphic or monotonous spindle cells, variable stromal hyalinization, and then these perivascular collagen depositions, which is kind of a clue. Um, it can have infiltrative growth. Uh, at this point, it's a provisional category, which includes the recently described lipofibromatosis like neural tumors uh, and tumor that closely resembles peripheral nerve sheath tumors. These will often have NTREC1 fusions some of them will have other uh, fusions, RAF1 and BRAF. Some of this can be detected by IHC uh, with NTREC1 or PANTREC or TREC-A um, immunostains, although not um, completely specific. But it's important to recognize this tumor. Um, and among, uh, you know, perhaps the most important reason, in my opinion, is that these are potentially therapeutically targetable with NTREC uh, rearrangement. So, you know, if there is a tumor in a really difficult place or if there's, uh, God forbid, metastas metastatic uh, disease, you know, this, these can be therapeutically targetable. And some of these do have some, um, you know, bad outcomes. So I think it's just important to recognize this tumor uh, and, you know, do the S100, the CD34 and SOX10 kind of as part of a panel and you should be able to get to um, the right um, diagnosis in the majority of times. But, uh, but this is a emerging entity. Um, okay, here's another um, interesting uh, tumor. So here at the top left, we have this spindle cell neoplasm with uh, sort of in a fascicular uh, growth pattern with some uh, admixed lymphocytes. Uh, the top right, we have, um, in addition, these two-ton 
sort of giant cells with this abundant bright eosinophilic cytoplasm and a bunch of histiocytes. And the lower left, uh, we have this bright eosinophilic cytoplasm with some pleomorphic cells, um, a bunch of um, inflammation, and then the, the bottom right, just sheets and zones of histiocytes. Uh, by immunohistochemistry, these tumors are uh, strong deposit for Desmond. Uh, CD163, which is a histiocytic uh, lineage marker, uh, be strongly expressed. A um, couple of these tumor, these tumors will have uh, limited myogenin and myOD expression um, as well. So the, the entity for the fifth edition is inflammatory leiomyosarcoma, but it raises the possibility of a uh, newly described um, entity known as histiocyte-rich rhabdomyoblastic tumor. And let, let me, give me a chance to explain. And I know this is a busy slide, but, but bear with me. So the inflammatory li, uh, leiomyosarcoma is a new addition to the fifth edition. It's very rare. Uh, inflammatory leiomyosarcoma was first described in 1995 by Merchant and Dr. Fletcher as the senior author. They had 12 cases. Majority of them are positive for smooth muscle actin, Desmond, and HH35. Most cases um, had a low mitotic rate, had this dense lymphohistocytic infiltrate, were well circumscribed, and a good prognosis overall. Now, in 2018, the genetics for inflammatory leiomyosarcoma uh, showed a really unique near haploid genotype. Um, and then a subset showed identical NF1 gene mutations. There were a couple other mutations, like non uh, random mutations as well, but I'm going to just mention this NF1 gene mutation. Now, in 2019, um, Anthony Martinez uh, and uh, Andrew Fulp, Sharon Weiss, and company wrote uh, a paper about histocyte rich rhabdomyoblastic tumors. And they uh, suggested that this is a rhabdomyoblastic tumor of intermediate malignancy. So they had in their series. I think they had nine cases, variably pleomorphic tumor cells, extremely low mitotic rate, prominent non-neoplastic histiocytes sort of obscuring the tumor. Uh, their, tum uh, their cases had diffuse desmin, limited myogenin, and myOD1 uh, with uh, diffusely strong CD163 positive histiocytes. Two of their four cases showed NF1 gene mutations. They were, there was not a extensive molecular um, study in their, their nine cases um, in, in that uh, original uh, paper in 2019. Uh, now, 2020, uh, McCall uh, said, uh, has a paper saying that, you know, inflammatory myosarcoma uh, has frequent co-expression of both smooth muscle and skeletal muscle markers and supporting a primitive myogenic origin. And uh, in their discussion, um, they make the argument uh, that perhaps um, histocyte-rich uh, rhabdomyoblastic tumor and inflammatory leiomyosarcoma are the same tumor. Um, and then uh, Melanie Bourgeau and uh, Anthony Martinez at, at Emory um, recently had two additional cases um, of the uh, so-called histocyte-rich rhabdomyoblastic tumor. And um, in their discussion, they say that, you know, perhaps inflammatory myosarcoma and histocyte-rich rhabdomyoblastic tumor may be the same, at least a subset of the cases. Um, but if a tumor uh, expresses rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, such as myogenin and myoD1, can you really call that a leiomyosarcoma? And perhaps maybe rhabdomyoblastic rather than a subtype of leiomyosarcoma is a better name. And that's just sort of the summary of some of the papers so far. The published data, there are 20 cases of inflammatory leiomyosarcoma. Four have reported metastases, but the follow-up has been less than five years. Those that have a near haploid genotype apparently have uh, quite good prognosis. The cases that are histocyte-rich rhabdomyoblastic tumor, 11 cases, two with the uh, Martinez uh, paper and then nine with the original report, no local recurrences and no metastases. So 
Um, definitely there's going to be some more studies yet to come, but I wanted to uh, mention this tumor, um, inflammatory leiomyosarcoma with the WHO fifth edition. And uh, so if you, if you see something like this, to be thinking about um, this entity, um, because I think it's important to recognize. Okay, here's another um, tumor. So uh, on the left, we have a uh, eosinophilic spindle cell neoplasm uh, with a second population of somewhat more primitive looking cells um, and an EBERT-ish was performed and positive. Um, so as many of you know, this is a EBV related smooth muscle tumor. Uh, this was uh, mentioned in the fourth edition, but now it's its own uh, category in the fifth edition. Um, it's a smooth muscle neoplasm associated with an EBV infection, usually in the setting of immunosuppression, such as HIV or AIDS, a transplant uh, recipient, or sometimes in a congenital or primary immunodeficiency setting. Uh, morphologically, there's these intersecting fascicles of smooth muscle cells. Uh, half of the cases have this second population of more primitive round cells. The prognosis uh, due to conditions, individual immune system, um, and, uh, but most do not metastasize. Uh, all right, here's a example of a tumor with uh, very plump uh, epithelioid to somewhat spindle cells uh, in this uh, myxoid background strum with a bunch of inflammation, including a bunch of neutrophils. Uh, you know, this is a intermediate power uh, photomicrograph, but this is um, in the gastrointestinal tract, there's mitotic activity. And ALK is performed in showing this uh, interesting perinuclear um, halo, membranous um, reactivity. So this is epithelioid inflammatory myofibrostic sarcoma. Now this is not its own um, separate entity. This is uh, just discussed in the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor section. Um, but, uh, but it has its own name. Um, in, uh, epithelioid inflammatory myofibroblastic sarcoma, um, and uh, commonly located in the deep visceral location, such as the GI tract, uh, often with this neutrophilic infiltrate. Um, ALK rearrangements are common, um, often detected by ALK IHC, and they um, often harbor these RAN B2 ALK rearrangements. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> here is a um, neoplasm in the leg of a patient with NF1. At low power, you see this um, very prominent marbling uh, or alternating really dark blue and more a little bit more pale areas. Uh, and then you see uh, what appears to be at low power to be glands uh, in through uh, the, the center of the screen. Um, a little high, higher power view. Some of the cells appear to have a little bit uh, pink eosinophilic cytoplasm, rhabdoid cytoplasm as well as some of these glands. Um, this is uh, Desmond down below, which is um, highlighting some of these cells. And then also have H3K27ME, which shows loss or a negative result here, but it's, it's actually a loss with a uh, internal control with a, a blood vessel. Um, so that this case here is a triton tumor with glandular differentiation. And I wanna mention uh, the important um, finding by Dr. Hornick and Fletcher and uh, Schaefer of this loss of H3K27ME and how that distinguishes uh, MPNST from the histologic mimics. So MPNST typically occurs um, in a couple of situations. Um, a sarcoma that is arising from a nerve, as you can see over here on the right, we got a nerve with a, a big mass in the middle of it. Uh, from a benign nerve sheath tumor, such as a neurofibroma, or in a patient with um, documented neurofibromatosis type one. Uh, and then a subset may occur in the post-radiation setting, 10%, and then a subset uh, are truly sporadic or de, de novo. Um, it's a spindle cell sarcoma with that marbling at nice low power, variable pleomorphism and fascicular growth, um, as mentioned, when you have heterologous rhabdoid differentiation, we call that a triton tumor. And when you have glandular differentiation, which is quite rare, uh, that is often seen in NF1. 50% uh, will have focal S100 or SOX10. It's never strong, except for the epithelioid variant. 
Um, and as I mentioned, the H3K27ME is lost in morphologically intermediate and higher grade tumors. Um, now, you got to be careful with that, especially on biopsies. You can have some patchy and, and heterogeneous staining. Uh, but like, that was a nice example of it being completely lost. Um, and genetics, there are NF1 mutations and chromosome 17, also have P53 and SUS12 uh, mutations. And that's um, shown sort of the uh, pathogenesis of the H3K27ME loss. Um, another really important addition to the fifth edition is uh, the proposed nom nomenclature for the spectrum of NF1 associated nerve sheath tumors. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire table, but um, I will mention a couple things. <clears throat> so this atypical neurofibromatous neoplasm of uncertain biologic potential, I think, is uh, quite important. Um, and so th the proposed definition here is a Schwann cell neoplasm with greater than or equal to two of the following four features. One that has cytologic atypia, loss of neurofibroma architecture, hypercellularity, or less than three mitoses per 10 high power fields. Now to make the diagnosis of an MPNST low grade, uh, a features of a ANNUBP, but with mitotic count three to nine uh, per 10 high power fields and no necrosis, and then a MPNST high grade would be a uh, MPNST with greater than or equal to 10 mitoses per 10 high power fields uh, or three to nine mitoses and having necrosis. Um, here's a, an example of a uh, spindle cell uh, neoplasm uh, that is sort of fibroblastic kind of um, appearing uh, and it's diffusely and strongly positive for STAT6. Um, as everyone at home knows, this is a solitary fibrous tumor. And it's kind of impressive to think that um, Solitary fibrous tumor was actually not in the 2000 or the, the fourth edition. Um, it, well, it, solitary fibrous tumor was, but STAT6 was not. So, STAT6, uh, nuclear expression of STAT6 distinguishes a solitary fibrous tumor from histologic mimics. Uh, this is an extremely important paper in 2014, again by Dr. Hornick and uh, Mertens, Fletcher, and uh, Leanna Doyle, first author. And uh, so STAT6 is the IHC surrogate for the NAP2 STAT6 gene fusion. I and mean, so far, this, this uh, IHC is held up pretty well. Uh, a couple uh, brief caveats would be um, D-differentiated liposarcoma uh, on occasion can express um, STAT6 with it being MDM2 on chromosome 12, STAT6, NAP2 fusion uh, nearby, uh, perhaps is, is the explanation for that. But, um, you know, just with caution with that exact with that entity and you know certainly consider MDM2 um, if appropriate but uh, but otherwise that six is, is a really fantastic um, immuno stain in my opinion and and just has this really nice robust strong nuclear uh, positivity um, <clears throat> here's another uh, tumor uh, that I wanted to, to talk about it's an epithelioid neoplasm with a chondromyxoid stroma and you also notice there's these uh, intra uh, cytoplasmic red blood cells, uh, so-called blister cells. Uh, on the right, uh, this has a immunostain for CAMP to one, strong and diffuse nuclear positivity. Uh, on the bottom, we have a uh, similar epithelioid neoplasm. Uh, this is in the lung uh, that is a little bit more vasoformative and it's um, strongly expressing TFE3. So these are both epithelioid hemangioendotheliomas. <clears throat> Most uh, epithelioid hemangioendotheliomas uh, harbor the 1,3-WWTR uh, CAMTA uh, translocation. A subset um, has YAP1-TFE3. Uh, and uh, important, I think, for the general surgical pathologist is one, you know, being able to recognize this tumor, of course, but that there is immunohistochemistry surrogates that you can use um, to help uh, make this diagnosis. And then also knowing that um, this uh, paper with uh, Dr. Fletcher and Antonescu, that there's a, uh, a subset of these have a different gene rearrangement, um, generally occurring in younger patients, and uh, often vasoformative, and these ones will have TFE3 uh, expression. Uh, this is malignant, even though the name hemangioendothelioma might think that it's, that it's not. 
um, worst prognosis for visceral sites uh, and uh, size greater than three or uh, mitotic activity. But, uh, but essentially, if it's in, in a visceral site, it's um, uh, wor much worse prognosis. Um, here is a, another tumor that has a bacteroid mixoid stroma, this corded reticular pattern, very bland cells um, in these cords and plexiform pattern. Down in the, the bottom left, it's a little bit more epithelioid. You have this uh, in the middle, you have all this hematoidin pigment. And then uh, via fish, there's a NR4, or NR4A3 rearrangement where there's separation of the signals. And so we have a, a green and a red separation. Um, so this is an extraskeletal mixed with chondrosarcoma. It's a translocation sarcoma, originally believed to be a chondrosarcoma. However, it's um, unknown histogenesis. However, uh, the reason why I wanted to add this into today's talk is that INSM1 um, expression and its uh, diagnostic significance with extraskeletal mixed with chondrosarcoma. I don't have an example of INSM1 in this entity. Uh, but I thought uh, this paper was um, important to, to include um, because this tumor extraskeletal mixed with sarcoma can be difficult to uh, difficult diagnosis to make uh, with just immunohistochemistry. Um, when the morphology is right, it's right, but it's um, it can be kind of challenging. And having this immunostain may be helpful. Um, majority of which will have an EWSR1 NR4A3 uh, gene rearrangement. Um, here's a, a neoplasm. The, the top uh, panel shows a uh, spindle cell tumor with this bright eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, and uh, it expresses keratin and ERG. Uh, this is a pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma, epithelial sarcoma like hemangioendothelioma, vascular tumor of uh, intermediate malignancy, rarely metastasizing, generally in young adults often with multiple discontinuous nodules in different tissue planes, it may mimic an epithelial sarcoma or myoid tumor. Uh, and recently, FOSB expression can be identified via IHC, which uh, serves as a surrogate to the gene rearrangement serpene one FOSB or ACTB FOSB fusions. Uh, here's another uh, tumor with these histocytoid uh, endothelial cells and a bunch of uh, admixed eosinophils. So this is a epithelioid hemangioma. It's a benign vascular neoplasm, uh, generally seen in soft tissues, the bone. Frequently, it occurs in the penis. 30% may recur. It's uh, rarely locally aggressive, does not metastasize. And this also has recently been found to have FOSB uh, expression via IHC. Um, Here's a tumor occurring in the bone, uh, but is a, a spindle cell neoplasm with this uh, bright eosinophilic cytoplasm, uh, a lot of mitotic activity, and uh, spindle to somewhat epithelioid. So uh, that was an example of a uh, intraosseous rhabdomyosarcoma. But I want to talk briefly about the spindle cell sclerosis and rhabdomyosarcomas. And what we have is three groups. There's a uh, congenital, uh, slash infantile spindle cell rhabdomyosarcomas uh, noted by these gene um, uh, abnormalities. Uh, another group has adolescents or young adults uh, typified by MyoD1 mutations. And then there's a, another group that has no recurrent genetic mutations. Uh, intraosseous rhabdomyosarcoma is very rare. Um, generally has a spindle to epithelial morphology frequently seen in head and neck, nathic, or pelvic bones. It's aggressive uh, and is associated with these FUS or EWSR1 and it's TFCP2 rearrangements. Uh, however, a subset has um, MEIS and CoA2 fusions. By immunohistochemistry, uh, interestingly, they'll have expression of ALK um, as well as myogen and myoD, desmin, and variable keratin expression. Uh, and then our last tumor for the soft tissue part um, is uh, this uh, interesting neoplasm. So this uh, very bland uh, tumor with admixed fat uh, and this kind of chondromyxoid uh, background stroma, some of which has kind of these grungy calcifications, higher power view, the cells are really bland and 
um, kind of banal or benign looking. Uh, and uh, here's FGF23 um, CISH, chromosome, uh, chromogenic and with it, which is positive. Um, so this is a phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor, as I'm sure most of you knew. Um, and it's, it's a rare mesenchymal tumor associated with tumor-induced osteomalacia, mostly in older adults. It can be in the soft tissues, acral extremities, head, neck, or bones. Um, it's rare in parenchymal organs, and it's also rare in the retroperitoneum. Um, as I mentioned, it's kind of a bland spindle cells, it's mixoid, uh, stroma, mature fat, may have these um, mangioparasitoma-like vessels, grungy calx. Sometimes the, the matrix may uh, have chondroosseous qualities. Um, and FGF23 is uh, a really uh, good uh, ancillary test to make this diagnosis. Otherwise, it's kind of this nonspecific, um, perhaps vimentin-only phenotype. Um, and there are some studies um, suggesting that the combination of ERG, SATB2, SSTR82, and CD56 can be helpful. Um, but uh, it is recently found to have an FN1, FGF, R1, or FN1, FGF gene fusions. Overwhelmingly are benign, and the surgical excision generally occurs the phosphaturia. Again, I didn't treat, try to get too bogged down in the molecular, but I think it's important to recognize this tumor because this can really be helpful for a patient who is suffering from phosphate wasting and is found out to have a, a mass and wants surgical excision, you cure the phosphaturia. Um, and so I think, uh, and the discovery of these gene fusions, I think is quite relevant. All right, so now let's get into the, um, the new section, the round cell sarcomas. Um, and we'll talk about Ewing's, the non-Ewing's round cells, and then the EWS non-ETS uh, round cell sarcomas. Okay, so here's a, uh, a neoplasm in the proximal humerus and then and also extend, or in the diaphysis extending into the proximal humerus uh, metaphysis perhaps, but blowing through the cortex and having this huge soft tissue mass. Um, and uh, it, the tumor, um, this is Ewing sarcoma, uh, the tumor uh, can be in soft tissues or in bone. Um, higher power, you see these extremely monotonous um, cells with tiny little dot-like nucleoli. And you know, I, I like to kind of describe the, the background kind of, not really cytoplasm, but uh, is it, it just has this kind of grayish hue which I think is, is helpful, but I know it's not specific. Um, it's around, otherwise it's just a round cell sarcoma. Uh, CD99 is generally diffuse, but it's this membranous uh, expression and it's generally really diffuse. Uh, and you know, in this morphology, CD99 is actually quite helpful in my opinion. Um, NKX 2.2 is a new immunostain. Uh, we've known about NKX 2.2 is a, you know, uh, a, um, transcription um, uh, target in Ewing sarcoma, but, but we, now we have an antibody for it and it's um, nicely and diffusely strongly positive here. Uh, and then of course, EWS or one fish is rearranged. Uh, you see the separation in the, the uh, red and green signals. Um, so Ewing sarcoma, it's a malignant round cell translocation sarcoma, mostly in the bones and the diaphysis, uh, occasionally occurs in uh, non bony sites. It's a monotonous primitive round cell sarcoma that scant cytoplasm. And again, it also has that kind of gray issue, which, which you know, I like to um, notice, although I know it's not specific. Um, and uh, the um, discovery of this NKX 2.2 is a useful immunohistochemical marker, um, I think is important. Um, and the combination of CD99 and NKX 2.2 um, is, is highly specific, although it's not perfect. Um, and so, um, as you'll see, I think, you know, with these round cell sarcomas, I think it's very important to um, do everything you can to properly diagnose them as accurately as possible. And uh, in most cases, refer them to a, a sarcoma center. But, um, but it, the combination of CD99 and KX 2.2 um, appears to be, with, with the correct morphology, good for Ewing sarcoma. Um, here's a um, EWSR NFAT C2 neoplasm. Here we got a, a spindle cell a tumor that often has these little pseudoacini kind of resembling myopithelioma. Uh, here it's occurring in the bone. Um, 
here's an example of EWS R1 PET Z. Here's a, a primitive round cell um, neoplasm, round cell sarcoma. Um, and so a whole a separate um, chapter in the round cell, um, I guess, section is uh, this EWSR non-ETS. So, so non-ETS meaning non-FLY1, non-ERG, non-ETV1, um, it, 4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so with the NFATC2, it's uh, four to one bones over the soft tissue. It's got little to no histologic response to neoadjuvant chemo. And again, going off of what I, I said earlier about it's really important to, to recognize these tumors. 50% um, um, express CD99, it can be diffuse. Um, you may have focal keratin and you may have CD138 in some and perhaps um, some of the reasons why these are thought to um, be myoepitheliomas with keratin and even some of them have thought to be um, hematolymphoid lymphoid tumors. Um, PAT-Z1 um, as well as others. PAT-Z1 often is found in the deep soft tissues of the chest wall and the abdomen. Um, a recent uh, study showed some of these tumors actually occurring even in the CNS. Um, and the response to conventional uh, systemic chemo has been negligible to modest. Uh, this tumor has got co-expression of myogenic and neurogenic markers. Um, and CD99 is inconsistently expressed. But a caveat here is our outcome data is limited. So you know, correctly identifying these patients, I think, is important to, for us to be able to understand these diseases better. Um, Here's a tumor that has a monotonous, uh, fairly monotonous, maybe you could argue a little bit of nuclear irregularities. Um, and this uh, myxoid background stroma, um, very high grade tumor. Um, this is a CIC rearranged round cell sarcoma. It's a very aggressive translocation associated. Um, most common partner is DOCS4. Uh, it uh, occurs in children and adults. Um, often in the extremities, trunk, pelvis, head, neck, brain, lung. Um, and it's these atypical round ovoid cells, sheets, nodules with this myxoid stroma. Um, and you often have geographic necrosis. WT1 can be used to help um, narrow down this differential diagnosis. It'll have a nuclear expression as well as um, ETV4. And there is an antibody out there called DUX4, which is quite helpful. CD99 is often patchy and it's, and it's generally not diffuse like you generally see in Ewing sarcoma. Um, and uh, like I said, the uh, CIC DUX4 is the most common fusion. Um, and it just has a much, much worse prognosis than Ewing's and B-core sarcoma. So again, important to, to recognize these tumors and get them to the right um, sarcoma centers um, for, for their treatment and also so we can correctly identify these patients and study them better. Um, here's another uh, case. There's a spindle cell, monotonous spindle cell to round cell neoplasm, raising the possibility of perhaps synovial sarcoma, poorly differentiated synovial sarcoma, among other things. Um, and other parts of this tumor kind of resembles what we just saw with the chick ducts, a little bit of mixoid stroma, uh, these round cells kind of with this uh, prominent um, cytoplasmic membranes. Um, this is a sarcoma with B-core genetic alterations, uh, rare primitive sarcoma, um, often in teenagers, um, often in men or males, um, more often in bone. Uh, it's monotonous round to spindle cell sarcoma, some with prominent nucleoli, may have that mixed stroma. B-core um, is helpful and uh, there's an IHC for that. Um, Patchy, typically patchy CD99, but can be strong, and it's negative for the WT1 DUX4 immunostains that I just mentioned. And the most common translocation is CCNB3. Um, and so far, it seems to have a similar clinical course as Ewing sarcoma, much better than the chick DUX. Okay, we get into the updates in bone tumors. So we'll talk about some new entities and new terminology. I'll discuss some select updates in uh, genetics and ancillary studies. But importantly, what doesn't change? And uh, for you at home, uh, I'm sure you, you know what I'm gonna say, and that's radiology. You always need uh, good radiology correlation in order to make um, a good diagnosis or an excellent diagnosis. You have to be able to correlate with radiology. So that doesn't change. Morphology doesn't change really either, but, um, but the radiology is kind of what's going at there. Okay, so um, for the fifth edition, we have a uh, neoplasm known as central atypical cartilaginous tumor slash chondrosarcoma grade one. 
Um, and here's an example of, of his tumor. It's uh, a uh, chondrosarcoma, hyaline cartilage bruising neoplasm, entrapping and prisoning um, host bone. Here you see it's completely surrounding normal host bone, um, very low grade. And uh, so, you know, this is a, analogous to a typical lipomas tumor and well differentiated liposarcoma, uh, the terminology, but it's this, the same tumor. So it's locally aggressive, hyaline cartilage neoplasm arising in the uh, medulla of the bone. Tumors in the appendicular skeleton, so long and short tubular bones. Uh, the preferred terminology is atypical cartilaginous tumor. Uh, however, tumors in the axial skeleton, flat bones, pelvis, scapula, skull base, uh, the preferred terminology here is chondrosarcoma grade one. So similar to enchondromas, 50% of these will harbor IDH1 and IDH2 somatic mutations, and uh, nearly 80% of the secondary central um, atypical cartilaginous tumor, chondrosarcoma or grade one will do that. Uh, prognosis is very, very good. Five-year overall survival, uh, you know, 88 to 99%, 10-year overall survival, 88 to 95%. So, and, and patients who die are generally due to local recurrence and difficult um, locations. So, uh, perhaps those are some of the reasons why the, the group decided to um, have a different terminology and somewhat analogous to a typical lipomatous tumor um, in the extremities. Um, here's a, one of my favorite tumors, very low power uh, view on the left. See these lobules of um, sort of uh, neoplastic um, cells in this chondromyxoid stroma, very hypocellular areas with a uh, peripheral condensation uh, and higher power view, extremely bland spindle cells in this chondromyxoid background stroma. Um, another high power view, very bland spindle cells in this uh, chondromyxoid stroma. And at home, I'm sure you all know that this is a chondromyxoid fibroma. It's a rare benign cartilage tumor. Young adults, um, typically, most are less than 40. Long bones, medullary cavity, and metaphysis, it's generally eccentric. Uh, radiologically, it has this well-defined lytic lesion, cortical thinning, and some expansion. And uh, with the help of um, Dr. Julia Bridge, uh, who was really one of the pioneers in uh, studying chondromyxoid fibroma with ab recurrent abnormalities and uh, chromosome 6Q, uh, we now know that they, are, uh, they show GRM1 gene rearrangements and upregulation on this chromosome 6 with various 5' prime partners. Um, treatment, curatage, local recurrence of 20%. All right, here is a um, distal uh, femur uh, epiphyseal um, lytic lesion here with a nice sclerotic um, rim. You can see it's a bright on fluid, uh, uh, T2 fluid um, sensitive imaging and MRI in the epiphysis. Um, histologically, we have these polygonal cells with these prominent uh, cytoplasmic membranes variable nuclear grooves, uh, and uh, some of which have um, kidney bean shaped um, cells, again, some of those uh, nuclear grooves. And this is chondroblastoma, and uh, really important um, uh, immunostain and paper showing that the molecular genetics of chondroblastoma has this H3K36M uh, gene rearrangement, which can be uh, or gene mutation rather, which can be um, targeted by immunohistochemistry, chemistry as shown here. So chondroblastoma is a benign immature cartilage tumor, less than 1% of all bone tumors, generally in the skelet skeletally immature, so younger patients, epiphysis, apophysis of long bones, and this H3K36M mutation, and we can detect that by IHC um, is this group uh, led by uh, Dr. Flanagan and, and um, Amory, um, have found out. Really, really important paper. Um, here's another um, example of a uh, bone tumor in the epiphysis, um, extending to the epiphysis, you got this uh, secondary aneurysmal uh, bone cyst like changes, um, sort of uh, thinning and with this cortical remodeling of the distal radius. Um, low power view, you see this um, tumor extending all the way to the epiphysis down here. Uh, 
and higher power see these um, numerous giant cells in this um, mononuclear cell population. Some of these giant cells have, you know, more than 50 nuclei, and this stands for H3 uh, G34W um, immunistic chemistry. And you note that the giant cells are negative. It's the, the mononuclear cells that, that um, stain. So this is giant cell tumor of bone, and uh, it's a common uh, bone tumor, um, <clears throat> and uh, with these um, polyhedral mononuclear neoplastic cells, um, and then these abundant osteoclastic giant cells. This is generally a tumor of adults, um, but also occurs in the epiphysis. 10% um, of the cases, though, occur in uncommon sites, such as the ver vertebra, the sacrum, head, neck, hands, and feet. Um, and then this uh, H3G34W antibody is actually really, really helpful in um, like clinching this diagnosis. Um, rare giant tumors of bone may metastasize to the lung, rare dedifferentiation can occur. Generally treated by curatage or unblocked resection. Denosumab, which is a ranked ligand inhibitor, um, can be used and also radiation in difficult cases. But again, that the same group uh, came up with a, you know, a phenomenal paper, this H3 G34W immunistic chemistry and really, really important paper in bone pathology. Um, benign fiber cystocytoma bone removed. Removed from the fifth edition. We realized that these tumors actually represent giant cell tumor of bone in non epiphyseal locations via the advent of G34W. Giant cell tumor of small bones of hands and feet removed. Removed from the fifth edition. We realize that these tumors actually represent solid aneurysmal bone cysts and contain the USP6 gene, re, uh, gene fusion rearrangement uh, that I mentioned um, several slides ago. Um, here's a, a bone tumor uh, that on the left, see this um, neoplastic proliferation here that is um, uh, not infiltrating the uh, surrounding host bone. A high power view, it's a very vascular, very vascular stroma with um, osteoblastic rimming of the um, cells. And then uh, here's another real, real low power. See this sort of this nidus of this richly vascularized stroma and this um, haphazard uh, deposition of osteoid. Um, so this is osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma. These are benign bone forming tumors. Um, but I'm talking about them today because they're recently found to harbor FOS or FOS B rearrangements. Similar to um, epithelial hemangioma and pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma that I mentioned earlier. Osteoid osteoma less than two centimeters, osteoblastoma greater than two centimeters. So, you know, this, um, knowing this can be valuable. It's not necessary for the diagnosis, but it can be valuable uh, for the general surgical pathologist out there at um, coming up with this diagnosis. Um, osteosarcoma. So, Subtypes of telangic, tannic, and small cell, which had their own kind of chapter um, in the fourth edition, are now removed and are now added to just the osteosarcoma chapter, um, which, uh, as you know, has um, osteoblastic, chondroblastic, fibroblastic, giant cell image, telangic, tannic, and small cell variants. Um, just briefly, here's a telangic, tannic osteosarcoma, this uh, malignant tumor but malignant bone forming tumor that has these um, big uh, uh, fibrous septae, lots and lots and lots of blood and hemorrhage, um, can mimic an aneurysmal bone cyst, but, uh, but this is a malignant um, tumor that forms bone, which is uh, the definition of an osteosarcoma. Small cell osteosarcoma, uh, another uh, kind of interesting rare variant of osteosarcoma, um, has very primitive small cells um, but these malignant cells produce bone, uh, immature bone, um, as you can see through here, and uh, so small cell osteosarcoma. Poorly differentiated chordoma, this is its own category in the fifth edition. It's very rare, um, 60 cases reported in English language. Um, it's essentially a poorly differentiated neoplasm of notochordal differentiation. Typically occurs in children, young adults, skull base, cervical spine, the sacrum. Uh, but important to know is that this actually has a loss of INA1, joining many other tumors now that we've, we have um, found will have loss of INA1. But this is the chordoma that has loss of INA1, and important to recognize that. Um, it will have brachiary, keratin, variable S100. But, but the important here is it, it's, um, its, own, its own category, and it's got loss of INA1, and generally occurs in children or younger adults. Okay, here's a tumor um, that is... Uh, 
kind of interesting and rare on the top left to see this um, thing that looks like a chordoma. Then you have this uh, overtly malignant pleomorphic uh, spindle cell sarcoma on the right. Uh, Brachiuri is performed on the bottom and it highlights this stuff that looks like a chordoma and then it's negative in the um, high grade and malignant sarcoma component. So this is a de-differentiated chordoma as um, everyone at home knew and it's in its own category for the fifth edition. It's a rare biphasic malignant neoplasm of notochordal differentiation. Um, older adults often in the sacrum but similar to conventional chordoma uh, and conventional chordoma juxtaposed with a high grade spindle cell uh, pleomorphic sarcoma. Um, and then, um, as mentioned, brachiuri, but it's often uh, lost in the de-differentiated component. Um, okay, the last section I'm going to talk about is the updates and mesenchymal tumors that are not in the fifth edition. And, and I'm really just going to highlight just a couple of these. Um, there are uh, other tumors, uh, but I'm just going to highlight just a couple. So <clears throat> this is a uh, spindle cell neoplasm occurring in the sinonasal region extremely bland um, spindle cells at the bottom left and also on the bottom right uh, and may have some ectatic um, blood vessels uh, and uh, various hyalinized stroma. Um, this is by phenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. It's an anatomically restricted low-grade malignant neoplasm shown dual neural and myogenic expression. It's locally aggressive, rarely metastasizing tumor. Um, generally occurring in fifth decade, uh, slight, slight female predominance, upper nasal cavity, ethmoid sinus, but it's a monotonous spindle cell sarcoma grown in this herringbone fasicular pattern, rare to absent pleomorphism, and also mitosis. The biphenotypic name comes from the S100 and SMA expression, variable Desmond, variable myoD, myogenin, but it's uniformly negative for SOX10. So another thing to kind of remember, it's uniformly negative for SOX10. Um, and the, the most common gene rearrangement is PAX3 and MAMMAL3. There are some alternate fusions. This tumor was um, described at the Mayo Clinic uh, with uh, uh, Gene Lewis, the senior author, um, and the, the genetics uh, were also uh, described by um, Dr. Oliveira and company of PAX3 and MAMMAL3. Um, and here's a, a just a recent um, review that I uh, wrote with uh, my uh, program director uh, at Mayo Clinic, Karen Fritchie, um, talking about biphenotypic sinusal sarcoma and a review on the, uh, an emphasis on the differential diagnosis. Um, here's a interesting and rare tumor, but important to recognize. Uh, this is a tumor occurring in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, diffuse sheets of uh, neoplastic cells that on higher power uh, are all fairly monotonous and have this uh, multinucleate giant cells and have this kind of eosinophilic to clear um, cytoplasm. Uh, so this is a malignant gastrointestinal neuroectodermal tumor. So it's a site-specific sarcoma of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and uh, it also gone by names of uh, clear cell sarcoma in the GI tract, um, malignant neuroendocrine uh, tumor of the osteoclast like giant cells. Um, it's a uh, you know, clear to lightly used to cytoplasm, monotonous nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and these scattered osteoclast type giant cells. Um, they often have this pseudopapillary growth pattern, which can be um, a diagnostic pitfall. Typically positive for S100 and SOX10, and are negative to weak uh, for melanocytic markers. Um, and that lack of melanocytic markers kind of dif differentiates it from clear cell sarcoma proper. Um, it does have uh, the same gene fusions, though, in that tumor as well as others, uh, which is a whole other different discussion. But it has uh, EWSR1, ATF1 rearrangements, uh, and then you have var uh, variant fusions with CREB and CREM. It's gotten a very aggressive clinical course with a very high mortality rate, and it, it just, it's really important to identify these tumors if, if you come across one. Um, and, uh, and then of our last tumors to talk about is this neoplasm. This is occurring in the stomach and you have these nodules of this uh, neoplasm uh, that uh, looks quite blue at low power, but um, in this nodular growth pattern. And then uh, a little bit intermediate power, you see these uh, spindle cells growing in this plexiform uh, growth with a very varying mixoid of fibrous background stroma. Uh, it, Additional views, this very plexiform mixoid background stroma, 
and these uh, very bland sort of spindle cells um, in this mixoid stroma. Uh, so this is a gastric plexiform fibromyxoma. It's a benign spindle cell neoplasm. It's a, essentially a site specific for the gastric antrum. Uh, and it's important because it's a, a very important gist mimicker. You know, you, you get this, this tumor and, and you're, you're sure that it's a gist, but it's negative for dog one, negative for CD117, negative for CD34. You go and do all the, you know, molecular things, SDAs, blah, blah, negative, negative, negative. Um, this will have an SMA expression and uh, it has a gene fusion, um, uh, mallet one, glee one. Um, and uh, this tumor was originally described by Dr. Mittman and Lasoto, uh, but it's, it's important because it can be a, a mimicker of GIST, uh, in my opinion, and these are benign. Um, tumors that I didn't cover, mixoid polymorphic liposarcoma, malignant uh, melanotic nerve sheath tumor, anastomosin hemangioma, fibrocartilaginous mesenchymola. Uh, there are other emergent entities out there, such as the GLEE-1 rearranged neoplasms, uh, certainly looking forward to what's in store for the sixth edition. Thank you again, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions.